Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 12, Nicholas Flamel. Oh, man, we have finally made it to Flamel. To Flamel. Of course, it's been a, it's been a mystery for our, our little golden trio for, for just one hot second. It has been a little bit of a mystery. They've been looking for it. This is one of those things where it's like there's there's a line in this chapter where Harry is saying like he knew he'd read the name before somewhere. And it's like like I, I remember as a kid having no recollection at all that he had read the name on the chocolate frog card earlier in the story but like i i'm so curious because i'll just never know like if you're an adult reading this is it like super obvious or you're like oh yeah it was on the chocolate frog card or it's like yes clearly this this book was not that long and if harry thinks he's read it you the reader have definitely read it because it's not like it wasn't even books ago this is book one so (laughs) that's the thing is that like yeah i think i think that this chapter is a really good representation of the evolution of my own uh, like consumption of media because th- this is this is you know one of one of those moments where it's like if you're paying sharp and close attention to specific details yeah and I mean to be fair I mean the the Nicholas Flamel line on the tra- back of the chocolate frog card is a, is a nearly throwaway line I it mean, is like, a nearly throwaway line and e- the here the thing is even if you remembered like when when Hagrid like says Nicholas Flamel if you were like oh that's who Dumbledore knew it's like even if you went back and found it it doesn't necessarily help you because all you then learn is that it was Dumbledore's partner in alchemy and if you don't know anything about alchemy that's still not going to get you very far and if you're like an 11 year old like reader of the book you're you chances are you don't know about alchemy right. even though all alchemy means is sorcerer stone which is the title of the book y- yes 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 precisely so if if you've if you've dug deep into uh like any any history like i, I imagine there are like some some college professors who are reading the books to their kids and they're like oh nicholas flamel that's interesting because like one of the one of the fun facts about flamel is that he is in fact a like a real person They're right like in in uh i think the the um his wife they actually call by name in this chapter when pa- they finally Paranel? Paranel, yes yeah. um that is actually the real nicholas flamel in the real world's uh wife that's there you her, go. that is her name so that is like that is actually um an actual piece of information that is true and those two real living people did live their life in pursuit of the philosopher's stone right they did so, not make it but then post-mortem they were like so, some other company would like attributed them as having successfully done it and they knew the recipe yeah or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah apparently but yeah also, obviously they don't <laughs> right because right, yeah, yeah. they're not here still with us yeah um there, there is that but anyway yeah so no i, I think this is this is kind of cool and and as i've gotten a lot older you know you know whenever i'm watching like a new series on netflix or like like if there's like a detail or like a character they're giving just like a little bit extra, you know, like attention to. Yeah. It, it's definitely one of those things where you're like, okay, that's someone to watch. This like, is like a fa- yeah. So this is something I've started to try and tune into on like reality shows oh, because right. yes, like yes, yes, yes. screen time is like the gold metric of like who's doing better in the show. Right. And like um, so like yeah, I'm watching Survivor this season and it's like I'm starting to try to I'm you know trying to guess like who's gonna win. It's like the people editing it know who wins. And they want you to like who wins right. and they want it to be compelling. So they're going to put whoever wins probably on camera the most. Cause like if you, if you didn't get to know them, then it's a boring win. This, this would be like an interesting stat to have somebody go through with like, like each season of survivor total, how much screen time each person gets and see how well it correlates with the, the winners. Oh, I know. And there, there is um, an Instagrammer. I think it's just called bachelor data who does this exact thing for like all the bachelor spinoff shows. Oh, and it's just like thing. this this contestant got the most screen time and look at that like like whoever got the most screen time in episode one either got the most screen time because they were going home like that week or because they're like in the final four yes and it's yes, like yes, yeah, yes, they, yeah they set you up immediately for it right, so right um yeah i'm not sure exactly how do we get on here <laughs> oh, <laughs> small details small small details yeah paying attention to the little things and um you know and, and again i mean this is the type of thing where i've i've always said like with the the potter saga it would have been so much fun for us as theorists to have been doing what we do now yes, when know. when the books were coming out but then even if um like let's let's say it's a hundred years in the future people have set books down for so long that like there's not just like resting canon inside of people's heads and they were to make you know in the year 
you know, 21, 23, uh, if they were to make like the Harry Potter TV show and people are like, oh yeah, it's this like old book series that was super popular. Right. Yeah. Right? Wouldn't that be crazy? Like, like it's just completely like falling off the map. Yes, 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 yes. But then it would be amazing if they, if they did like a chapter by chapter breakdown and episode per. And at that point in time, like there was like reference to Nicholas Flamel in like one of the earlier episodes and deep divers could go back because that's the other thing too, is that like how much theorizing do you do inside of the same book right like how often are you putting the book down to just sit there and contemplate and be like wait a second okay yeah I'm putting the pieces together. It's interesting that Quirrell happens to be in each of these scenes. Like, like, right. Like, could you pick up on that Quirrell's the bad guy? Right, right, right. It's like, we're we're not seeing McGonagall in each one of these scenes. It's always Snape and Quirrell every time. Yeah. Um, You know, and it seems like every single time, you know, Quirrell always seems so inferior and scared and, and all the rest. So it's like you, it's, I mean, especially for an 11 year old, but for anybody reading the book, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're just, it's a great decoy. You're just not paying that much attention. It's a great decoy. And then on top of that, the entire Nicholas Flamel mystery is just a decoy. True. Like, also true. you know, like yes. it's not like they're hunting on that because they want to know what Fluffy's guarding. But like you, the reader, could probably figure out again from the title that it's the Sorcerer's Stone. And it's like, but you're so invested in like, who's Nicholas Flamel? Like you're you that like you're more focused on that than you are like is Quirrell the bad guy? Because it's like, yes. there's no there's no doubt in your mind that it's Snape. He's just mean all the time. And I will say this chapter in particular, I think is, I think it abuses a little bit of, um, uh, I, there, there, there's, a, there's a scene towards the end of the chapter where Snape is talking to, to Quirrell. Quirrell. Yeah. And the line of questioning, I feel like is like unfair to the reader. I, like, it's it's like th- there's no reason like when you know the whole story Snape's line of questioning to Quirrell in the forest makes no sense. I know, I know, and I, I almost want to like just put like an earmark in that. Because yes, we'll I, come back I literally, to it. It was the number one thing as I finished this chapter. I was like, I really want to talk to Jay because I I think I I find this to be written in such a way that is that that may fall under critique more than yeah. other, other aspects. So we'll we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. We will. I feel like that's a that's a good tease for what's to come in in, in today's episode. All right. Well, we'll start getting into the page by page here um, in a second. But first, I do want to draw attention. I just want to give a huge shout out to all of our listeners, Ben, yes. because we so got people have been posting their Spotify wrapped everywhere. Did you did, did you get yours like your personal one? I got my I got my my personal Spotify yeah. wrapped, which I'm not like all, a massive, all Taylor all the time. All Taylor, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big Swifty. Yeah. Um, but but for real. Um, no, but my my number one song. Uh, is like a heavy metal version of um, of one of the songs from Moana. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So it's like I love the heavy metal covers. Uh, yeah, how far I'll go. Yeah, that, that's so funny. Mine was uh, Bluey. Wow. Yeah, just the the Bluey album. Uh, in particular, uh, I've seen a lot of other parents that it's like, yeah, yeah, it was Bluey your top album this year? Because it was mine. And it's like, yeah, tell me you're a parent without telling me you're a parent kind of memes. Yeah. And yeah. then like, but I am kind of, I'm a little proud of my kids because I've talked to other parents who were like in this category and you're like, yeah, we had like our top songs like Cat Squad or something. I'm like, oh wait, I don't know that one. And it's like, oh yeah, you gotta know, you don't know Cat, you don't know Cat Squad? Cat Squad's like a song that's like played in the background by one of the annoying toys, but okay. it's not like featured in the episode so much. It's just like every time it comes on, the dad is like, no. Hey, it turns <laughs> so out Cat like, Squad. We got we got Cat Squad in ours, even though I will tell you, it is equally annoying oh. to real life parents. Oh, so dear. there's that. Okay. But anyway, um, if you are most people are getting their Spotify raps um, and it just tells you about your listening habits. But if you are on the other side, if you are the people making stuff that other people listen to, like podcasts like this one, you get your own Spotify rap yes. for like um, how things did. So. It was very, very fun to go through and look at the Spotify uh, wrapped. Just so some fun facts we got out of it is that the this podcast through the Gryffindor was streamed in 97 different countries, which is just unbelievable. So I mean, that's, crazy. That's wild. I know. So thank you guys so much. And this yeah. was what a really cool stat I thought is that the top country was predictably the United States, but that was only 42% of the global community. I know. I know. I was like, whoa, I don't think I don't think we've ever had one of our projects before be more popular internationally than than here in the states. Yeah, so like so. like whilst 
while the largest amount of concentrated people live in America, there are they would be outnumbered worldwide. Yes, which yes, is yes. crazy to that me. Crazy. So that's yeah. amazing. Um, it gave us like our, our average uh, rating for the year via Spotify, which was 5.0 out of 5.0. So bravo. Thank you guys for all those amazing ratings and reviews. Um, and then we even got one that said we peaked at it said we charted for five weeks and peaked at number one. And I was like at number one, what like on what specific chart? I don't know. I, but, I know. I know. I saw that same stat and I was like, wait a second. What? Like, wait, wait. like we were never. I mean, we were never. Never. We were, I was. I know yeah. we were never. Never one. Were we? Were we number one? I don't know. But yeah. it, that's what it said. I have the stat. I've shared it on Instagram today. This is one of those rare occasions where I was like, I'm going to need some permission to brag for just just one second. <laughs> just like, OK, this is pretty cool, though, right? Like this is cool. No, I know it's so it's it's a, it's just absolutely incredible. Yeah, so it's really neat to see that. Yeah, so that was really cool. And then um, I was looking at some other just random more like Apple charts today. We were presently number five in America for entertainment news. So bravo to us. Okay. And we're presently in the same category. Number one in Guyana. They just I mean, Guyana, they love us down there, Ben. How about it? I know. How about it? Shout bravo. Out to <laughs> so, so that was really fun. So those were just some of our fun Spotify rap stats. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, it was so fun to look at those. And I just I can't wait to continue doing it. And uh, we'll jump in now more into chapter 12 Nicholas Flamel so the basic breakdown here is that Griffin the Griffin Nor versus Hufflepuff Quidditch match is looming and if Griffin Nor wins they'll take the lead in the house cup from Slytherin something that hasn't happened in six years and I want to come back to that particular fact in a second okay. um, Harry Ron Hermione encouraged Neville to stand up for himself which sets up a big scene later on in the book yes um, Hermione they quickly finally solve who Nicholas Flamel is what Fluffy is guarding they just de- discover Snape's going to referee the Quidditch match and then after the match for some unknown reason Harry is left completely alone by himself and follows Snape into the woods where he overhears a suspicious conversation yeah. <laughs> which so this this chapter I feel like it is it's like a lot happens but overall I felt like it was something of a low point for the book. There's a lot of like, oh, we got to take a couple leaps of faith here in There's, a couple of directions. Yeah, no, one of the things that I found to be particularly interesting is that, yeah, I always remember loving the uh, the Quidditch matches, and this this particular Quidditch match is not even told from Harry's perspective. No, it's not. Yeah, you you're know? just like in the stands with like Ron and Hermione. Right, this is this is totally like one of those like Mandela effect situations for me where I'm like, I don't remember it being this way. Yeah. Like, you know, like I, I would have assumed that every single Quidditch match would be told from from Harry's point of view. So just just another one of those rare circumstances that that really feels um, not that there's none of them. I mean, eventually we'll have like you know the the Riddle household and um, Frank Bryce kind of going up there and right. exploring you know the lights on and stuff like that. Like, but of course Harry is still witnessing that whole scene unfold through his dreams. It's the beginning of Goblet of Fire, and then we have Spinner's End with Snape, Narcissa, and Bellatrix. Fast forwarding to Half Blood Prince, yeah, uh, where the Unbreakable Vow is made. But um, and then even the planning of the Seven Potters meeting in Deathly Hallows. The planning. The, the planning of the Battle of the Seven Potters, which I guess the Death Eaters are planning to attack early. Oh yes, 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 yes. You're yes, you're right. You're exactly yeah. right. That's like, but then that's following Snape. Yeah. Um. But this is a strange situation where um, it's still a very Harry centric situation. I mean, Harry is like physically and like uh like from a narrative standpoint the center of attention um in inside of this match and it's not yes. it's not mentioned from his his point of yeah, view. Yeah, it's so. rare that inside of a chapter the point of view switches away from Harry. You have to wonder if this is at all done uh just simply because like how much inside of this first story like can can you just deliver to proper Quidditch matches like complete top to bottom with with what's going on and this chaser did this and this you know score happened yeah, here right. and um, like even the fact that the like Harry ends up you know winning the match within five minutes yeah. like kind of proving once and for all like hey I'm good at this for real mm-hmm. um, uh, almost feels a little bit like yeah, this 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 match needed to go quickly. Yeah, I mean, it was very. It's a great situation. It's a great example of like the like Quidditch itself as an entity driving the plot forward, but the match itself not being that important. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, um, yeah. So we 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 start off the chapter here, and um, Harry basically coming on the heels of his adventures with the invisibility cloak mm-hmm. and exploring the mirror of air set. He's basically decided after his interaction with Dumbledore to hang up the old cloak or fold it and put it in the bottom of his trunk. 
Yep. Um, and sort of uh, work his way there. He does start having the nightmares. I know. I read um, that and I was like, I don't really remember that particular line. I was like, that's so sad that like he got to see his parents and it was like such a happy thing and he went back and back and then he like stops going and now he's having nightmares. Not because like he misses them, but because having seen them, the the once dormant memory in his mind of them being murdered is becoming more and more clear. Yes, like more of the yeah. details are finding like finding their way back into his his memory, which yeah. is just devastating to to think about. Um, so we're we're getting a little bit of that, like uh, some some different you know uh, reactions from Ron and Hermione. Uh, where I think Ron is just sort of like like see that's exactly what Dumbledore meant. It could make you go, uh, it, it could drive you mad, and it's like oh no. Oh. Yeah, yeah, right. You don't want to think that's what happened to poor Harry. Yeah, there um, is a there's a line here about Hermione. It says she was torn at the horror idea of Harry being out of bed, running the school, uh, roaming the school three nights in a row and disappointment that he had at least not found out who Nicholas Flamel was. So this is one of those things that I because we um, I just finished reading the first book to my son Luke. So we've watched the movie. Yes, and it's like this is one of those weird like book versus movie things were like in the movie Hermione comes up and tells like she's about to leave for Christmas break and she's like we haven't found them in the library and yet she's like well we haven't looked in the restricted section happy holidays and then like leaves like she totally tells them to go do it right 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 this yeah is, this is Hermione like planting permission being like wink wink yeah and I was like <laughs> like I don't want to be here to to be like one of the I don't want to be like you know involved right in, in this particular portion of rule breaking but as long as I'm not here you may as well go look yeah. this is before she even knows they have the invisibility cloak so right, right, I right. went back and looked and like in in uh in the book Harry just wanders past the restricted section and is like hmm I wonder and so he has his own idea about it. So yeah. Hermione's not involved at all. But um, yeah. So uh, okay. So then immediately following that, we we learned that Wood is working the Quidditch team harder than ever. And there's a couple of paragraphs back to pack that kind of stood out to me because they both reminded me a lot of Prisoner of Azkaban. Yep. Okay. Um, for for very similar reasons, both of which kind of would tie back to Lupin in particular. Um, but of course, we just mentioned you know Harry's having these nightmares and stuff. Uh, but it said uh, quite apart from wanting to win, Harry found that he had fewer nightmares when he was tired out after training. Yes. Um, um, this is interesting to me because when Harry is learning to cast his Patronus at some point in time, the first memory that he tries to use in order to like summon like the most positive thing to overcome mm-hmm. the the intensity of the presence of the Dementor is his first time ever flying a broom. And so to me, this is almost like one of those instances like where where positive experiences almost sort of like are are actually part of the recipe that help like fight off the darkness yeah. altogether. There, I mean, literally even later in the chapter, Dumbledore will come up to him after the match and say, nice to see you haven't been brooding about that mirror. Been keeping busy. Excellent. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. So it's it's almost like like this is this is actually like a like a you can start to understand even like magically how positive memories could be fuel for creating something that is otherwise um, like concentration of positive force. Yeah. Because because that that memory, that thought is the is the essential ingredient mm-hmm. in being able to cast the the Patronus. Right. Um, so I like that. And then it's immediately followed up with this scene um, where let's see here. Oh, wait, maybe I was jumping, jumping ahead just a little bit. I may have, I may have got my pages wrong. It's the scene where uh, Neville returns to the Gryffindor common room and he's run into Malfoy who cast the leg locker jinx on him. Yep. Um, and basically, you know, he's like, everybody's kind of giving Neville advice inside of the moment. And, um, you know, Ron saying like, you've got to stand up to him and stuff like that. But what Harry does is reach into his pocket and hand him a chocolate frog, yeah. which is kind of interesting. Cause this again is a little bit of like a looping thing where it's like, this is just Harry having good instincts. It's just that, good like, instincts about chocolate. Yes, because like again, magically, it seems like chocolate quite literally has like healing properties that can like help you recover from magical malady, if you yeah. will. And and so it's just like the fact that like this is the specific thing that he does in this situation. It's like Harry's right on cue without knowing why he's. I doing I mean, it. it is. Yeah, this chapter does have a bunch of things that like speak to a lot of the things Dumbledore like finds more important than like things that like Voldemort doesn't understand like to his like downfall yes like the power of like 
candy and friendship and sports and love right. and stuff like that. Like all of these things are very present in this chapter and they're all things Voldemort doesn't understand. Yes. That like Harry reaches for immediately or is like, oh, I'm having nightmares. Let's go focus on something like sports. Right. And it's like that that is all stuff that like Voldemort can't get. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's like it's like it's what allows Voldemort to be Voldemort for for worse. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say for better or for worse, but just for worse. Okay, so yeah. I don't know if this counts as foreshadowing, but I just thought it was like a little funny thing. So when they're um, the practicing Quidditch, they find out that Snape is going to be uh, refereeing, and Oliver tells the team, he said, that's exactly the sort of thing that's going to lose us the match. Snape's refereeing this time, and he'll be looking for any excuse to knock points off Gryffindor, and it says George Weasley really did fall off his broom at these words, and I just thought that was funny because it's like later on in Deathly Hallows, Snape is the one who who hits George from a broomstick with the Sectum Sempra curse and like take his ear off. And oh my gosh, you're right. I didn't <laughs> catch like, that at yeah, all. So it's like so uh, so Snape is responsible for George Weasley almost being debroomed or be or just quite literally being debroomed. Yeah, yeah. So the next time, yeah, Snape Snape the ne- so Snape the the news that Snape is going to be refereeing causes George to almost fly, fall off his broom and then uh, later in Deathly Hallows when they're both on brooms together again, he actually takes George's ear off. So wow. <laughs> yeah, just totally random, but there you go. Nope. That's a good one. That's a good. That one. was a fun one. Um, this is another one of those situations where, like, like Snape's refereeing. I mean, to be fair, like you, you might call it, you might call this particular circumstance unfair, uh, just given the fact that Snape very clearly cares about winning the House Cup and the yes. Quidditch Cup. But it's not exactly like Madame Hooch didn't allow five illegally scored goals, like while she was looking the other way against Slytherin. So it's like, right. you know, you, you might literally think like, like, oh man, well, Snape's not going to play fair, but it's like, Madam Hooch wasn't exactly doing great either. She, yeah, one, like, not only did, yeah, does she like not stop the game, do, and Marcus Flint, all of his goals count, but three, like, she was unable to do anything about the broom yes. being cursed, you right, know? Right, right, yes. Like, like, you did, like, to the point where she doesn't even stop the game. So it's like, she's just a very ineffective uh, referee. <laughs> I know, I know. The the thing that blows my mind though is that we of course know uh, taking several steps backwards and looking at this like from the perspective of adults, you know, it's sort of like, okay, the reason Snape's out there is just to make sure that Harry is okay. Like this is almost certainly at Dumbledore's request right. that, that Snape be out there. Although, I, I mean, the difference between him being out there on the broom versus just standing in the stands doing exactly the same thing. Seems I know, sort of there. Minimal at best. And but then the, like Dumbledore's presence at the match seems to like indicate to everyone like, okay, that's okay. Everyone's safe anyway. Right, right, right. Yes, if Dumbledore himself is just there, which it also, it also, it also always surprises me that Dumbledore just doesn't attend the matches. I know, like, uh, like why wasn't he at the first match? That, right. is, that is bonkers to me. That's another thing that like it's easy to miss because of the movies like in the movies Dumbledore is there at the first match which then makes you wonder like why didn't Dumbledore do something about it if Snape was doing something about it it's like Dumbledore really should not be at the first match but then he also he definitely should be because like at the end of the day he's like the principal of the school this is a big school event happening on the weekend like what what else this is his job (laughs) maybe the first go round Jay maybe the first go round he's just like hauling the mirror of Erised through the front door and he's just like goodness gracious this thing is heavy yeah right yeah he's he's, he's up in school setting that up the monstrous mirror into the door but no we already know the well I mean maybe I mean perhaps at the time but the mirror is already at the school right like yeah no I know okay yeah I was was, was trying to I was trying to invent wildly there Mm -hmm. Um, yeah but anyway the thing I can't believe is that like Snape is quite literally on like on orders what he is doing there is uh, operating with the intention of not allowing Harry to be to be damaged, but also there's there's like a, still a little bit of like pettiness. There's enough pettiness in there where he's like, I'm here to protect the kid, but like I'm not gonna let him win the game if I can. I know, like it. we're like, still gonna make we're still gonna like favor Hufflepuff. Okay, like my, my brain, come on, my brain would not work this way. Oh like, my, I, it's know, so it just, like, hard to comprehend yeah. because like there is like this funny like once the game starts, there is like a moment where it's like oh. Like immediately, Snape awards Hufflepuff a penalty, but it says because George Weasley had hit a blood rat, and I was like, "That's actually fair. That, you know, you can't attack the ref. That's true of any sport. Like, yeah, yeah, if anything, like, you're lucky you didn't get thrown out of the game. That's exactly, honestly yeah, like it, that's pretty lenient on Snape's part. But then, like two seconds later, it said Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason at all, and it's like, well, it's like why are you doing that? Like before that, you had good reason. Like there's no reason to just favor Hufflepuff like that. I, I don't. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, not yeah. Not, not entirely. Yeah, no, yep. I don't know if it totally tracks. There is one scene real quick here that I wanted to touch on before we get to the game itself for though, sure, uh, which is that, you know, Harry leaves Quidditch practice 
Christmas and he's going back up to the um, the Gryffindor common room where he finds Ron and Hermione playing chess. Mm-hmm. And there, I feel like there's just like a good Ron moment. Yes. Um, this is like one of those things where uh, like basically Harry approaches and if you can imagine like Ron and Hermione are sitting there in like a heated battle of chess and Ron says, don't talk to me for a moment um, as, as Harry goes to sit down like next to him. And inside of this situation, he's in the, he's halfway through saying, I need to concentrate when he cuts off because he catches sight of Harry's face and goes, what's the matter with you? You look terrible. Like this is one of those things where I do feel like people, you know, it's like it's like this is Ron being a really good friend. Like he's he's very like he's focused on what he's doing, but then he's so dialed into Harry that it, it immediately takes priority. Right, exactly. Which which I think is this is this is like a good Ron friend moment which yeah ron doesn't always have you know i mean he doesn't he's ex- he has a lot of very very good ones in the first book for sure yeah i also just like that it does mention that chess was the only thing hermione ever lost at something harry and ron thought was very good for her like <laughs> i like in the first book that really it feels like they're really set up for like harry to be the one who is like in the moment good in the heat of battle good instincts hermione with like this wide background knowledge of all the magic they might need but maybe is not so good in the moment yeah. and ron with like this like I can come up with the strategy to employ, but then if things go crazy here, you need to take over. It, it, and it's like th- that that is abandoned pretty hard after the first book. It is. Yeah. yeah. It, it seems, it seems like there was some setup for Ron to be like the, like the plan guy, yeah. you know, like sort of like he might be able to like invent wildly and Hermione be like, well, that will never work. And it's like, but will it, but <laughs> won't it? You know, it's like, it's just crazy won't enough it? to work. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> of course it won't matter because everything's going to go crazy as soon as the, the, the trouble starts, but you know, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yep. Um, but yeah, so then of course the other, there's the the really great scene. I mean, overall, I, I mentioned a little bit already, but the the scene with you know Neville kind of showing up and uh, Harry has a great moment as well, where Neville has basically just like really been bullied in the worst way. I mean, this this is an instance where like like the the Malfoy has found Neville's weakness and he is just needling Dude, it. Malfoy, the hi gosh, I I never notice it as much. Like I guess Malfoy starts to like care less about Harry in the future books or whatever, but his obsession with the Gryffindor first years in this book is like do you want them to like you, man? Are you like, are you like crushing on the first, the, the first years here? Like, like, do you want them to be your friends? Cause you are like going out of your way to be around them. Even if you're being mean. Yes, 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 yes. No, I know. I mean, it, it does. It holds some of that classic behavior where it's like the, the person you pick on is the person you actually really like. Right. Is what it, what it feels like could be, could be happening a little bit there. But um, yeah, so Neville says, there's no need to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that. So I just wrote next to that, just mean and sad. So mean. Um, um, and th- but that being said, there's like a little bit of foreshadowing here because um, w- we know that coming up in like the next chapter or so is going to be, um, uh, let's see, it's Neville, Hermione, Harry, and Malfoy go into the for- Forbidden Forest yes. where, where we discover that Draco himself is is rather terrified yes. of, of the dark and the danger and everything. So a little bit of that going on. And then, of course, I mean, that being said, like... Malfoy just ends up being completely wrong and in the end Neville is sort of like the the like you know paramount representation of House Gryffindor. Oh, of course, um, yes. So he's just he's just completely and utterly wrong. Um, not to mention standing up to the the bullies will end up being standing up to you know his friends, which is yes. arguably even harder. I to know do. they'll like set this up, uh, yeah, for for later, right there. Um, then there's this uh, when they find who Nicholas Flamel is. There's this um, trick where Hermione says, "Stay there," and she she said she sprinted up to the girls' dormitories. This is just like the the first example of Hermione doing this stunt a lot, where she will like realize something and then run away without telling anyone what it was and it's like they do eventually draw attention to it but I thought that was just like worth noting that this is like the first time it happens well, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so for <laughs> more more Hermione runoff moments to yeah. come yep absolutely yep. absolutely oh and then she says I never thought to look in here as she pulls up the book that actually has information about Flamel in it and it's like I w- it doesn't say what book it is I want to know like they looked at so many what book finally had it I know yeah that's true that's true uh, and we, we do get the the like little bit of light reading joke though that they yep. carry over to the movies this is light yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Is this the first mention we actually get of of uh, the word sorcerer stone? I think it is. Yes. Other than the than the title, this is the first time we learn the word the sorcerer stone. Yes. Yeah, so and Nicholas, what it does. Yeah. So it's Hermione who says it. Nicholas Flamel, she whispered dramatically, is the only known maker of the sorcerer stone. So I highlighted it and said, "Hey, that's the title of the book." Hey, <laughs> that's I, the name of the movie. <laughs> they did the thing where they said the thing. 
Um, yeah. So then next page over, we get to learn a little bit about Nicholas Flamel himself uh, and what the Sorcerer's Stone is capable of doing, which is, of course, turning metals into gold and the otherwise elixir of life. I love that it says that it belongs to Mr. Nicholas Flamel, the noted alchemist and opera lover, as if his like love of opera is equal to his achievement in creating the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, right, like he's he just be- as well known for loving for loving for opera, loving opera. Like, yeah, yes. yeah like i mean it must be a remarkable passion for right? opera I in know. order to, to merit such such uh proximity there the other thing i always think is interesting is that it, he just celebrated his 665th birthday mm-hmm. which of course means that his next birthday would be 666 yes i made note of that as well and that's just one of those things that i always have a question about like um wizard books like whether or not like when hermione's reading this is like does that number change every year? Oh, you know, like is it possible that he's older than 665? It does or is it like magically enchanted to like update itself? Man, what a good question. I I like to think that it's magically enchanted. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely think that that seems that seems like a like a worthwhile bit. Either way, that's all such good trivia because that's like one of those things. It's like how old was Nicholas Flamel, and you're like, gosh, six hundred and something, you yeah. know. And it's like it's it's one of those where it's like if you can use any number as a helpful hint inside of the six hundred to seven hundred range, yeah, and can find that six 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 thing and then like work one backwards. Right. It's like it's like there there is a way to learn it. Right. Um, this is exactly like my how many staircases are there in Hogwarts Castle? It's like one fourth. Three, that means I love you. Like, oh, you right. Know, yeah, whatever. there you go. Go back one. Yeah, go back one. Yeah, exactly. So, um, anyway. yeah. So do you think that's like intentional that it's like he just misses out on 666? It's a good question, right? Because um, like I, that's sort of like what Voldemort's like after, you know, or y- y- yes, right? Yes, I think that that's intentional. Yeah, absolutely. It, it can't be a mistake. Yeah, th- I think. Yeah, that's like that. He just misses out on like the the evil number or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. The only other thing I can think is just it's a happy accident from the actual real Nicholas Flamel's like when he was born until 1990. Oh, that could be it too. Yeah. yeah. So there's some possibility where it's that's worth fact like, checking. Yeah, I suppose th- that would be worth looking into. Yeah. Um, let's see here. The other thing is uh, is that then immediately after that, um, Harry says a stone that makes gold and stops you from ever dying no wonder snape's after it anyone would want it this is one of those i think this is an illusion inside of lots of like take any you know modern marvel superhero movie any movie that features like a super super like villain kind of you know your voldemort's thanos whatever who want to like take over is like immortality sounds exhausting yeah, me. like it, it's like one of those things where it's like I, I understand like the underlying appeal and the the generally shared fear of death like, yeah. is something that like it's, it's easy to understand on like a on like a very, very, very simple level. But it's also to like I mean, to imagine like a world where where it's like, OK, well, I just need to continue to like I mean, and maybe I'm thinking about it way too literally. And if you had the Sorcerer's Stone, you can make gold. You could just go live and do and follow your passions for all the time and always, sure. you know, um, because because that would certainly then just be plenty attainable. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I Sometimes I'm like, gosh, this... this I, I think immortality is over, overrated, and I also think that um, this idea of of being the supreme ruler, like sitting on top of the Iron Throne... Oh, so um, much work. It's yeah, so, so much, much work. responsibility. Like, yeah, like the, the basic guarantee of being a world leader is that 50% of people don't like you. Yeah, it's right. Like, right. It's, like, it's like, why do you want that? Like, I what? do. Yeah, but like somewhere along the way, I feel like it's it's carried over from from, you know, like this idea of kings and queens and the ability to like live in this giant glamorous lifestyle and stuff like that. Right. I'm like, I think it's I think it's just it's more stressful than it's worth in my personal opinion. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just the take there. So just just a small aside on on the uh, consistent inclusion of this idea of either achieving immortality or otherwise just seizing power. Right. There's all, like both of those sound rough. Right. And it's also like, I guess, um, as of the movie Crimes of Grindelwald, we sort of get the answer to the question of whether or not the elixir of life um, 
just keeps you alive or like also like maintains your youth and it mostly just keeps you alive. <laughs> and, and yeah. yeah, like you're not like Nicholas Fumel is not like a like a 25 year old dude looking dude who's 600. See, and I actually felt like this was a giant missed opportunity in Crimes of Grindelwald because what we what we meet him, he is ancient and and like Jacob Kowalski like shakes his hand, which like, you know, seemingly fractures it right, on yeah. contact, which which essentially is like, what kind of quality of life is this person I living know. over here? Like, that seems that seems so miserable. And, you know, at some point in time, you you see Nicholas basically having to, you know, look at the the book, the communicator book right, thing. Yeah. That's like the the earliest version of the Order of the Phoenix, maybe. Um, and it's like he's he's basically being like called into action. He's like, I haven't seen action for however many hundred years or something like that. And then and then of course he does ultimately show up at the the monastery at the end of the film. And it's one of those things where I was like, this this to me, because they even give it give us a money shot in the movie of the Philosopher's Stone. I'm like, yeah. This to me feels like a missed opportunity to not have him show up all youthful and spry and young. And, mm-hmm. and like what you see is like I use the Philosopher's Stone to achieve this level of of health when needed. Right. But like when he shows up, he's still just as ancient so as just ever. old guy. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man, like I, I feel like they could have younged him down from how we had just met him to be like, oh, wow, that's that's a pretty powerful. Right. Oh, yeah. Know, like piece oh, of magic. Like, right. OK, like when he, when he like, you know, he lives as himself and that's being true to yourself. Like, right. he's, not, he's not lying to himself about his own age. Yeah. So you live in your everyday life and, and be true to yourself. That makes sense to me. But then when the moment is needed, you can seize the youthfulness right from the stone from the stone. So but anyway, they didn't, they didn't go with that particular direction. Nobody asked me. So nobody <laughs> asked you, that's Ben. Just, that's just my two cents and a huge departure from uh, from our chapter. Yeah. Here, so. Speaking anyway. of things nobody's done, uh, there's a line here that says Slytherin. Uh, the idea of overtaking Slytherin in the house championship was wonderful. No one had done it for seven years, which like the way that is written makes it sound like not only has Slytherin won the House Cup for the last, what, six years, but no one has literally even taken the lead from them I know. in that time. And, and what is remarkable to me about this is that during that period of time, Charlie Weasley was like apparently like the player of the year. Player of the year, not good enough to take the house lead. Never, at, like, Never. at no point in time. Even at this point, Slytherin has lost to Gryffindor and they've still not lost the house lead. Like, what is going, like, is, like, I mean, this is one of those things, so like, like to me, either there is like cheating going on with like the points or whatever, and it's like sort of. I mean, it, but it doesn't look like it. You know that Snape is just like you know boosting his numbers all the time, right? Especially because I think like, and everybody kind of makes the joke. It's sort of like you know, like like Dumbledore gets to the end of each year and he's like, all right, how many points do I need for Harry to win? Okay, yeah. carry the three. You know, like whatever. It's like when Harry is there. Dumbledore is biased. He's biased towards There's Harry. No doubt. Everything yeah. has to do with Harry. He hires Lockhart to teach Harry about like the dangers of fame. You know, like he's got every single thing from the moment Harry steps into the school is all about Harry because because there is a prophecy in play because there is a dark lord attempting to return because like because the fate of the wizarding world depends on it. So sacrificing certain things in the name of Harry having all the tools he needs inside of Harry's time there absolutely something that Dumbledore is doing. I wouldn't argue with it ever. Right. You say it's for the greater good. I would say it's <laughs> yeah. for the greater good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I would say that. Yeah. Um, but then I would say any time before that, though, I don't see any reason in the world why Dumbledore would be biased towards any houses whatsoever. I think that Dumbledore has enough righteousness in him to not do that. Yeah. And I suspect that he would also not allow Snape to uh, unwittingly, like, you know, just, just keep going and giving Slytherins more points to the point where it's like, it's unfair. Like, it's like Sev. You know, right. Nobody can win the House Cup if you keep doing this. Like I, I don't think I don't think he would permit it. So it's like yeah. it must be the case that that Slytherins, by their own merits, are winning. Yeah. This is why the the end of this book when Dumbledore gives the House Cup to Gryffindor. Like obviously Harry and Ron and Hermione do great things and they earn a lot of points and that's yeah. great. Yeah. Clearly Dumbledore is just pulling the rug out of the out from under the Slytherins at the same time. Yes. And it's like it. I feel like it would feel better if the Slytherins had like done something bad too. Like it felt like they didn't deserve the lead. It, and it's like, like it Malfoy is a jerk and he bullies some people here and there. But in general, Malfoy is not like super responsible for Slytherins success in the house cup, right? Like there are six 
There's every other student in Slytherin has has like not just one but dominated the other houses like at at just schoolwork, yes, which is how most of the points are given out. Right, and it's like it really stinks. If you're just a seventh year Slytherin student this year, it's like. Are you kidding me, man? I almost like, clean cheated. I this. almost come on. That is a, now. I will say there is my other the other possible explanation for why for Slytherin's reign during this time period is possibly the same explanation for the like low class sizes where like sometimes it seems like Hogwarts must be mat or it feels like Hogwarts is massive, but then you're like, well, there's only like ten students per house. Per year, you know, per house per year, right? So forty students, so like roughly two hundred and eighty students, which doesn't seem like that big of an entire school all of a sudden. No, it's smaller than our high school. Smaller than our high school, and I mean, yeah. you'd expect the wizard population to be a lot lower, but maybe not like less than three hundred kids in the whole school for a whole country, right? You know, like is it that low? And the explanation. Um, sometimes given is that this particular class of students is coming out of like um, out of it's like 10 years after wartime. So it's possible the um, the population of parents making kids who would grow up to be wizards is just lower. Yeah. So in particular, though, because of Voldemort's specific nature and who was on his side, it hit the the Slytherin um collective of families would probably have been less affected in that way yeah such that they might have had more students or more unaffected families who were raising like children who were less affected in that way yes so it, it, that is a possible explanation it is indeed and, and another one that i think is super possible is you've also got um horace slughorn out there who is uh making great connections mm -hmm. for all of his former slytherin students and, you know, kind of like setting them up for paths for success. So it is entirely possible as well that there's there's like a certain kind of parent that, you know, the, the, they're like the, the the possible, you know, doctors and lawyers or whatever of, right, the, yeah. of the wizarding world who are, are sending their kids, you know, with, with a little bit of an advantage, a little more privilege at stake, kind of stepping into, yeah. you know, their time at Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. So it's always possible. It's, always it's possible. possible. Not yeah. that Slughorn always played like house favorites. That's also true. You know, like yeah. he loved Lily Potter. That's or yep. Lily Evans, I guess. Lily Evans. It's a good point. Presumably, good point. this is always a thing I wonder about the Slug Club, not to get too far off topic here, is like, like he loves Lily, and we know she was in the Slug Club, but like, what, like it's also she's in the same year as James and Sirius, who were described as the best at everything they did. Like, certainly James and Sirius were in the Slug Club too, if not Lupin as well. And, and right? You know, this, I, who knows? Maybe it was all the detentions. I mean, which, that's true. Uh, which apparently they received hundreds of hundreds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, maybe maybe, maybe Slughorn was like, all right, you're talented, but you cannot stay out of trouble because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, the, he also overlooks Fred and George, but he's not there with Fred and George. But so. he even when he's talking to Harry, he's like, he laments that he didn't have Sirius in Slytherin. He's like, oh, talented, talented young wizard. Dad, too, too bad he wasn't in Slytherin. I'd have liked the like, set. I'd have liked the set. And it's yeah. like, but you still could have had him in the slug club, right? Yeah, easily. Yeah, easily. easily. You, like, you if you thought he was that good, you still could have like, no. quote unquote, collected him. You know what? If Regulus was in the slug club, there's no way. Sirius would go. Oh, sure. Like, even if he was invited, I like, guess. Yeah, there's that's no true. Way. That's yeah. true. You're Sirius right. Would be like, nope. You know, you're right. If yeah. if Regulus is in, Sirius is not going, and then James is not going out of solidarity. Right. And then clearly, you know, I doubt Peter would be invited. But <laughs> no I don't way. think no Lupin. Way. I don't think Lupin would go either. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lupin would. Lupin. And this is like one of those where it's like you know, Slughorn is Slughorn. Uh, like, I, you know what? Maybe Lupin would go. You think so? Because because here's why. Because okay, I'm just comparing them to Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and Hermione goes and True. Harry is frequently invited, but because Ron is not, he's like, I'm not going. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Yep, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely yeah. right. So maybe, maybe Lupin does still go if they're if they're the counters of each other. Right. All right. All right. All right. Anyway, so, so we, we get a little bit extra <laughs> foreshadowing now that we've gone completely off topic here. Uh, as as the match grew nearer, um, we get a line that says Harry didn't know whether it was he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to keep running into Snape wherever he went. At times, he even wondered whether Snape was following him. And it's like, yes, he is. Yep. Um, absolutely. And then at the end of the the paragraph, we also get Harry didn't see how he could yet. He sometimes had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds which he also can he also do. can do and it's like possibly is yeah yeah it possibly is this is the thing though if because he's clearly what what is bonkers to me is that well it, it that this line and the fact that we know that snape actually can read minds and this line suggests that that's an established like 
um, quality of his early on. Uh huh. Like this is I think this is like a line that's supposed to age well. But the problem is that he is later in this chapter, like talking to Quirrell, trying to get information out of him and is like unsuccessful at doing so, which at the very least to me seems like Quirrell must be good at occlumency or Voldemort or Voldemort is good at it. Yeah, I mean, I guess Voldemort does teach other people to do occlumency and we know that he's good at it. So I, I think that I think there's a chance if if they are inside of one another's own mind that Voldemort can actively be the one Practice like Practice. repelling Snape's legitimacy. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. I accept that. That's that's my head cannon. So, okay. Anyway, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, th- th- then we we finally make it to the Quidditch match itself, where uh, Ron and Hermione basically are like waving him goodbye, what like wondering whether they'd ever see him alive again. I know. And this the- is this <laughs> is one of those things where I'm like, okay, that's an exaggeration, right? Like you can't possibly have thought he was going into this match where death was on the where line. Where death is on the line. There's also this slide where Neville, who couldn't understand why they look so grim and worried, or why they brought their wands to the game, and I'm like. What do you mean? Why would they bring? Don't you bring your wands with you everywhere, if all I, of the time, if, everywhere? If I'm a wizard, it's always on. It me. is always, always on, on me. me. Yes. Like I mean, my phone is basically always on me, and wand way better than phone. Yes, absolutely. I would trade my I would tra- trade my smartphone for a working wand any day of the week. Any day. Any day of the week. Any day. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, then we have uh, we've already mentioned it, but then Dumbledore uh does does in fact come to watch the match, which yep. is just something I highlighted. I was like, okay, yep, kind of. Right, yeah. t- Talked like that. Uh, talked about that a little bit earlier. Yeah, you'd think you'd always about there. Oh, we get the name of the spell for the leg locker curse, which is locomotor mortis. Which I I want to say just the the loose translation is death to movement, which I think is a hilarious translation. Yeah, that's basically what it does. Yep, yep. No, it's a good one. It's a good one. I mean, your 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 legs in a lot of ways can be your your primary. You know means means for movement yep. and so yeah to to eliminate that uh that makes sense okay and then we get to the next page and we're in the match and we um shift the focus down to harry or to ron and hermione in the stands and who decided this this baffled me when i was reading it is that all of a sudden draco sits behind them and i'm like why why draco. like the stands are massive like you have to be going out of your way to come just like bully these people no like it, yeah no <laughs> what this are you doing i I actually like how the movie does it where the, where there's like house stands you yeah. know, for each house because I'm like that makes sense to me like I could see going and cheering on um, you know with with yeah. your fellow classmates right or whatever you know from Gryffindor the yeah the fact that they're all in the same stands together it's like what yeah. why why, why yeah, would we, they all be there yeah for that matter this is a great example of just proof that the houses that are not playing do attend the matches yeah. because you know what Slytherin's not playing and Draco's there but you know what Harry never does go to any other Quidditch game ever it's almost like he doesn't actually like the sport yeah. <laughs> he, he's like I like to play I want to watch I want yeah, to be right? in it you know you like, think you go to the Ravenclaw games you know he's like oh my god I guess I see how Cho's doing oh, yeah. I just want to see who's going to win the match. Nothing I, else. Yeah, Jeez. I would not mind just the the casual throwaway line where you just get to go see like Harry. It's like you know, it's like uh, like you don't have to like give us the, all the details. Just be like, oh yeah, I was going to go to the the Ravenclaw match this weekend. It's like why? Hey, what, my, what? what are you doing that for, Harry? Just, just see what's happening. Just, no I'm big just, deal. I'm just interested. I'm just going to pick up some tips. Yeah, yeah. She uh, must already be there, right? Probably not. Maybe not on the team yet. But she's yeah, she's older, older, right? Yeah. So she's she's a second year Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw doesn't have a huge presence in this book. <laughs> not so much. Not so yeah. much. Um, let's see here. Um, which which in the movie bothers Luke to no end because of the sorting ceremony in the movie. You get to see obviously like the main cast all get sorted into Gryffindor and Draco into Slytherin, and then you get Hannah Abbott sorted into Hufflepuff. But the sorting hat does not say Ravenclaw in the movie. <laughs> Man, this is yeah. So it's like literally yes. Yeah, so you don't get a Ravenclaw sorting, and you don't see Harry cast a spell the entire. It's so yeah. yeah what it, it's like it's like there's like certain very essential details. So if if anybody ever does remake the series, you know, which it sounds like possibly is going. To happen it's almost just like can we just see more of that let's just show us some yeah little more well magic. i mean to be fair he also doesn't cast a spell in the book <laughs> that to be fair is, he doesn't cast a spell in the it book. is it is implied because it talks about the exams and what they had to do and clearly you would have to have used your wand to complete the exams um so it is implied off page that he used his wand to cast spells successfully because he passes the exams yeah but on page when we're with him, he does not cast a spell. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Which um, is just like how, what, how, how, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, so anyway, uh, as we yeah as we move down though, Harry of course wins the match in a record five minutes. Five minutes. Basically the fastest that anybody has ever been able to capture the snitch before. You get the the line from Dumbledore where he basically congratulates Harry and is like, "I'm glad to see that you haven't been you know brooding about the mirror." But then you get a line that says, "Snape spat bitterly on the ground," and it's just like this is this is another one of those details where it's sort of like, why? Why? Like. Why would Snape spat bitterly on the ground? Like what? Like what is it? What is it? Like this is like one of those things where it feels like it's going too far out of the way to suggest that like Snape is so petty as to as to be upset right. that Harry fairly won a game. I know. Like it's like that. That this. That's one of those. Like it feels like unfair to the reader. It's like it gives him like a. Like I, I guess he, I guess he did spit at the ground, and maybe he just is that petty. But this chapter is the like the big like uh, it's Snape, he's the bad guy yes. chapter. Yes, it, it definitely has got like flashing lights all around it. But, yeah, but, and and I want to get into that properly because uh, we're we're really about to dig into the weeds of of this chapter. Yes, we in are. My opinion. There's one line that I want to talk about in particular that I that that stood out to me, but um, it's basically Harry's own sense of pride and uh what it means to him to have like won the second match because you get the line that says he'd really done something to be proud of now no one could say he was just a famous name anymore and this is just like one of those things where it's like you know harry struggles with imposter syndrome for most mm-hmm. mostly for quite all a of bit the story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean it's i would say i would say he's only overcome it in the f- in, in the flaw in the plan um which right. is the final like key chapter of the mm-hmm. whole series but uh, you know sans the epilogue um and but this is this is like a good brief moment where i, I think it's a highly relatable thing in life you know because i mean it, it's it's so remarkable how quickly you you as any individual out there is willing to dismiss your own success as beginner's luck or i was just on the right side of chance or right. you know like like it's like yeah it's like you know it's not like someone else caught the snatch and he's on the winning team right yes yeah. yes yes so like this this is like a prime example of of it's like yes you did it not only once but you've done it twice you have now proven like you know like that that wasn't a fluke that you are in fact good so anyway i i think personally that's just something i've struggled with in my life before where it's like anything anytime anything good has happened i've always assumed that it was just like well it probably that, that was probably it though that ben, was, can that i tell was, you something yeah what's up we are the number one news entertainment podcast in guyana <laughs> that's true so you know it, you know wear what? that with pride i will we are I'm, yes for sure I if love you're it. listening down there shout out to you guys shout thank you to, yeah thank yeah. you for doing that for us um so though anyway as we trudge forward though um basically harry is sort of amidst all the celebration when all of a sudden he is just by himself this taking this is his broom to the to the broom shed unbelievable this is the most unbelievable part of the whole chapter yeah is that like so what is happening here is that for the first time in the last seven years slytherin has lost the lead in the house cup thanks to harry potter the chosen one special boy who defeated Voldemort and has now simultaneously knocked Slytherin off the podium with a Hogwarts record fast catch of the snitch. And suddenly he's alone in the locker room. Like the Gryffindors win a lot of other Quidditch matches that have a lot more celebration following them than this on way less like dramatic terms. I know. I like, know. Yeah. Why is he by himself? Why is he by himself? It makes no sense. Yeah. The, the rest of this chapter is probably the, <clears throat> the one that I would say. Yeah. I, I feel like the most like, I don't know about that. Like, yeah. Like, it's like, are you sure? Um, but basically, yeah. So Harry is, he's walking out with his broomstick. He sees a shadowy figure leave the castle and work its way towards the forbidden forest. Um, recognizing that it was Snape um, prowling. Harry actually hops onto his Nimbus 2000 and takes off. This is one of those things where i'm like this feels like grounds for expulsion like i don't know why but it's like the idea of using your broom to go in and and like fly about the grounds yeah it's i'm like man that seems that seems so off limits it does feel a little off limits you know it's like it it almost feels like the type of thing i mean they're not allowed to do magic in the corridors yeah i know let alone just go for a joy ride on your (laughs) on your flying broomstick around i know around the grounds but if you've played hogwarts legacy you can fly your broomstick wherever you want <laughs> okay okay so, so it's, just, it's just wide open territory maybe. <laughs> um but anyway that's that one always stands out to me where i'm like i'm like nervous on his behalf i'm like harry's gonna someone's gonna see you you're especially 
<laughs> Not just someone's going to see you. You're there to spy on the professor that actively hates you. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Yep. Um, but he does. Uh, he does fly around. He's trying to listen in on the conversation that Snape is having. Um, Harry does discover that the person that he is talking to is none other than Quirrell. He does land in the towering beech tree, uh, which is interesting because there is a very famous beech tree next to the Black Lake that oh, shows up. Right. And it's like they're oh they're always doing homework underneath it. It's like where James is tormenting Severus and um, you know the the Prince's Tale mm-hmm. like the flashback. Yeah. So this beech tree in particular um, is is particularly like relevant, I think, overall to the story. Like we keep coming back to it in a way that I don't think as many times as I've read it, I've been able to truly find the significance behind this particular tree. But like it is, it is like it's just a, a notable tree. It's a notable location. Yeah, it's a notable location. Is so there something mean. about like beech wood wands or something? I'm sure that there is. I know that oaks are considered the kings of the forest and beech is considered the queen of the forest. Oh, interesting. Uh, like as far as like like uh, like tree lore. Oh, is tree concerned. lore. Yeah. Not even inside the wizarding world. Okay, that's, I was like, oh, is this, is this we're outside now? Yeah, we're outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that's just externally. So I mean, beech trees are rather magnificent looking trees. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they they can they can look really impressive. So um, it makes it makes sense. It is the kind of tree that you could in fact land in. So there's that. All right. Um, from there though, we basically have the scene, and this is the one where it's like I, I would almost want to like dissect everything that Snape is saying because you, the reader, are supposed to be seeing it without context. And the way that you're supposed to interpret this particular scene is it's almost like because you don't know the position that Snape has, you are supposed to believe that like it's all coming across as incredibly incriminating. It's all suggesting that like Snape is clearly possibly working with Quirrell or attempting to get information from Quirrell about how to get past Fluffy and how to collect the Sorcerer's Stone. Right. But me knowing the whole situation, me knowing the twist of the book still reads it and it still sounds really bad. It doesn't. I mean, like, it sounds really bad and it's like it, it almost doesn't feel like it makes sense. It, yes, exactly. It's yeah. like, you know, it's like, um, you know, like like Quirrell is sort of like, I don't know why you'd want to meet out here of all places, Severus and Severus, you know, Snape is all like, I thought we'd want to keep this private. Students aren't supposed to know about the Sorcerer's Stone after all. And it's sort of like, so is is Snape the best example that I could come up with is that Snape is once again playing double agent here. That like Snape is attempting to convince Quirrell that he is on Quirrell's side and they together are attempting to capture the Sorcerer's Stone. Okay. That that is like the explanation that works best for me. But then, you know, because You're right cuz like otherwise like why like Quirrell otherwise knows that Snape knows that he's trying to steal the stone. Right, yes, exactly. Right. I mean, like like I mean basically like it's just it's just point blank that like this the way it reads is is almost as saying that Snape, yeah. You're right. You're right. That almost has to be what it is is that Snape is trying to tell Quirrell like you are going to help me steal it, but in telling me how you would do it, you will be revealing to me how far you who I think is trying to steal it have actually gotten. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Because yeah, because the, the line in particular that really stood out to me was just we'll have another little chat soon when you have time to think things over and decide where your loyalties lie. Right. And it's like if you're supposed to be reading this and Snape is supposed to be convincing Quirrell not to do it, then um, why, why, like, why would he say the phrase? Ha- have you found out how to get past the beast of Hagrid's yet? Right. You know, it's like, I mean, like, like I'm, I'm gonna have to turn you in. Have you found out how to get past Fluffy? Because if so, like, that's too far. That's right. too much information. Like, if you, yeah, if, if you're Snape and you're asking Quirrell, like, do you know how to get past the stone? Like, if you're, you know, if if your position is that you think Quirrell is trying to steal the stone, and Quirrell thinks you're on to him like he's not going to tell you how much he knows. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, so it's it's I don't know. It's it's a weird one. It's um, as if Snape has like told Quirrell like you are going to figure out how to get past that dog so that we can steal it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It feels like that's more of what's what's going on. Which right. Maybe makes more sense in the scheme of even like Dumbledore's big plan, which is, you know, this this idea that Dumbledore is, in fact, pulling strings all along because we we know again when you go to the prince's tale that by this point in time Dumbledore has already assigned Snape the duty of 
keeping an eye on Quirrell, which means that Dumbledore already knows that Quirrell is trying to do something uncouth. Right. That, like, he's behaving in a way that is otherwise mysterious or unknown or, like, unusual in some way, shape, or form. So if you buy into the idea that what Dumbledore is attempting to do is essentially, like, align everything so that Harry goes down after the stone at the right moment, then having Snape uh, operate on his behalf as an ally to Quirrell helps keep Dumbledore informed in just how far, how much progress Quirrell is making. Sure. But like, do you think, I don't even know if Snape knows Voldemort is involved, right? I suppose he, yeah, I suppose I mean, he Dumbledore might. just keep an eye on Quirrell, will you? Right. It's like, yeah. like, I think Dumbledore, that's the other thing is like, does Dumbledore know that Voldemort is involved? I think he must. Yeah. I think he must because I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we'll come back to it eventually, but there's the line from Harry that after he's gone down into the chamber at the bottom, you know, where, where Harry will eventually pretty much say like, I'm pr- I think, I think Dumbledore thought I deserved a chance to try. Yeah. And to me, the way it reads is that Dumbledore knows in, in book one, Dumbledore knows literally every single thing that is going on and sees Voldemort at this point in time as such a small threat yeah that it's kind of like it's not that big of a deal like even even sending Harry you know as we'll see soon into the Forbidden Forest for his detention where we know Coral slash Voldemort is going to drink unicorn blood Mm -hmm. it's like you're absolutely sending him into what is otherwise the lion's den. Right. You know, it's like you're sending him into a in a into a dangerous situation where the the dark entity known as Voldemort is is currently right and could strike. Um, it means to me that Dumbledore has enough confidence that this Voldemort never stood a chance. Right. Like the, he he never could do it. I guess he sort of already knows like that Quirrell can't touch him too, like a little bit. Yeah, that's true. You know, because he's true. not like he's down there. But later on, he's like, do you know why he couldn't touch you? Right. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. Maybe he thinks that's in play. Yeah. But so um, otherwise, yeah, like the Snape is talking to Quirrell and he says, um, yeah, you don't want me as your enemy. You know perfectly well what I mean. And then he has to ask. This part doesn't make sense to me. He says, you're a little bit of hocus pocus. I'm waiting like Snape doesn't know what the other enchantments are. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Like, what, and I'm like, what, don't, what don't all line? the teachers know what the other things are like he's asking him like what did you do like what what did what did Dumbledore ask you to do like how are you protecting the stone right right right, right? so the owl hoots which basically yeah. is why we don't get the full context of the sentence it says yeah. an owl hooted loudly and Harry nearly fell out of the tree he said to himself in time to hear Snape say your little bit of hocus pocus I'm waiting so it's like what is the front half of that sentence I don't know I, I all I can imagine is that it's like, yeah, he, it's you're right. It's like as if Snape is coming to Quirrell as if he, Snape, is trying to steal the stone and he's trying to get Quirrell to tell him. Like as part of his cover, he has to like pretend he doesn't know what Quirrell... Like if, if I'm trying to steal a stone, then I'll need to know how to get past what you did. So tell me what's your bit of hocus pocus. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and I mean, at this point in time, it would come across to me as if Snape doesn't know the involvement of the other professors like that's that's how it kind of reads yeah like so if you again if you, <clears throat> again if snape is a double agent inside of the situation then basically what he's saying is like i'm 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 trying to help you here and unless you can let me know your little bit of hocus pocus like what did you do like right that you know and if you're not willing to tell me then then you need to really determine where, like where your allegiances lie right because where else would they lie right with the school, I know, like the safety like, of the stone. I know, like uh, the the uh, the allegiance. Unless you're letting Quirrell know that you that you think he's trying to steal the stone, is like is your allegiance needs to be with me, Snape, or with the school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if it's with the school, I'm your enemy. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, I I think it's I think it's unnecessarily misleading. I think without this particular page, you already you the you the reader already think it's Snape. Like yeah. you, you've already been misled well enough. But this one feels like it goes a little bit too far, in my personal yeah. opinion. So anyway, I, yeah, we can move on from there, uh, where Harry does return to the Gryffindor common room, uh, and Ron is shouting, "We won! We you won! We won!" Um, 
<laughs> and he, you get this line it says, and I gave Malfoy a black eye and Neville tried to take on Crabbe and Goyle single handed. <laughs> He's still out cold, but Madame Pomfrey says he'll be all right. Oh man. Talk about showing Slytherin. Mm-hmm. Um, th- that I always love that line just because it's like, it's like, like Neville tried to take on Crabbe and Goyle single handed. I mean, he lost, of yeah, course, he but, failed. Like, but he tried, but he <laughs> went for it, man. Yeah. We're proud of him. We're proud of him. No way doubt. To go, way to go, Neville. So I there's love- a little bit of bravery coming through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We got a little bit of a Marauder's Map action here too, where Fred and George stole quote unquote some cakes and stuff from the kitchens, where it's like they later find out that Fred and George are not stealing anything, that they just basically show up in the house of they're like, here, you want food? Yes, yes, they're very willing to do so. So yeah. that's that's like one of those those party tricks that's a little bit less impressive when you know how easy it is otherwise. Exactly. Um let's see here. So anything else anything else major? Uh nothing else major in the chapter. Basically the the trio just concludes that the sto- like that the stone is only safe as long as Quirrell's able to stand up to Snape. Oh no, we're all doomed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, at this point, they still don't even know Voldemort's involved. They're just like concerned about the safety of the stone. Yes, yeah. yes. And it, it is a little bit interesting that nobody has theorized at this point in time that the the most obvious threat to everybody is the one that would be you know, coming back. Right, exactly. So, it, I mean, it is interesting how the story is laid out where, like, you're distracted by the mystery of who Nicholas Flamel is and then by the idea that Snape is trying to steal the stone. And at no point, even though you've been introduced to the idea of Voldemort, like, are you concerned that he's even at play? Right, right, you know? right. Yeah, it's much more just the mean school teacher who you're worried about. Which, right. on some level, like, this, this is, like, one of the things that I'm sure we'll talk about a lot with Umbridge, but, like, you know, when you get to book five, the thing that makes Umbridge so despicable to the point where I think a lot of people hate Umbridge more than they hate, um, you know, Voldemort himself yeah. is it's it's a much more relatable villain. Yeah. And, and I think that this is also true once again for the exact same reasons. It's like, you know, as an 11 year old, the idea of like the, the power that teachers hold over you yeah. as, as a third, fourth grade student, mm-hmm. you know, is rather substantial. And and so the idea of having like that mean teacher who's got it out for you, like that's way more. It's, it's easier to to worry about and despise that character than it is some otherworldly dark lord that wants to seize all power and reign dark darkness on right know, like as an 11 year old you're not worried about those things right yeah like, no you know it's, it's harder to understand but but when he's a big bad that's just hiding looming in the shadows or whatever it's like when he shows up you'll understand it when he gets there because right you know how to understand a big bad basically enough because he's just a classic villain so. right exactly right, yeah. right, right. anyway um how about chapter art what do you think chapter art so this one is interesting so uh, it is basically just snape running into the forest um i think it's a little bit confusing because it doesn't really match the title of nicholas Flamel that yeah, much, which true. I think is like like you know that's not Nicholas Flamel running into the woods right there. Although this one's per- it's fairly interesting because this particular chapter art was used as cover art as well for um, some U.S. Uh, publications publications the of the Sorcerer's Stone. Interesting. Yeah. So that this was like the cover art some people had um, for I think it was like. Uh, it was like it, it wasn't the initial release because that's the classic one with Harry like on the broomstick trying to catch the snitch flying through the arches with the castle in the background and stuff that most people had. But this was a different one that I learned about when we were doing all the um, the cover reviews of all the different Sorcerer Stone ones of which there's like over a hundred different covers that have been printed for this book. It's but, unbelievable. But this was one of the US ones. I think it was like the book fair edition. Like if you had the book fair come to your school, this oh, is the cover buy, you buy got. Copy. Yeah, so there's that. Otherwise, I don't I don't necessarily love this one just because it doesn't match the title that much. And it's like I, it's not clear, I guess, whether it's Snape or Quirrell. It is Snape, I guess, running. That's who Harry eventually says he sees there. Um, that doesn't look like a beach tree either, as far as I know. Yeah, those are pine you know, trees. Those yeah. are pine trees. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is a question. Um, th- maybe this would be a separate game instead of rating our chapter art. Almost sort of like, what would you rename the chapter oh, to be? Yeah. Um, because there's a part of me, like I know that event in, uh, let's see, is it Half Blood Prince? I think it is. There's a chapter called Draco's Detour. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that this is absolutely just stealing from that one. In which case, you might need to rename that particular chapter. But Snape's Detour feels like it could just as easily be the name of this particular. It does. Chapter. Snape, it does. Right. Like um, what? Yeah. It, it's interesting. Interesting to me, this would be like one of the ones that would totally get me on a quiz where it's like, what is the name of the chapter where Harry defeats Hufflepuff uh, in record time? And it's like, right. you would never think that a Quidditch game takes place in the chapter titled Nicholas Flamel. I know. I would even maybe just call it the Sorcerer's Stone. You could call it the because Sorcerer's they find Stone. out about yeah. it. And I think most books have one of the chapters named after the title 
of the book. Certainly Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, Chamber oh. of Secrets does. The Prisoner of Azkaban. Just Prisoner? Maybe not. Goblet of Fire. Goblet absolutely of Fire does. does. Order of the Phoenix absolutely does. The Half, the Blood, Half Prince. Blood Prince. I think the book, right? I think so. Yeah, I think the book so. is. And then the Deathly Hallows. Yeah, I think so. Or is that chapter called Xenophilia's Love Good? Ooh, no, I think it's the Tale of the Three Brothers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, it's one of those. It's one of those. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so most of them, I think you could call this one The Sorcerer's Stone because that's where they actually learned about it. And it's the title of the book. <laughs> yes, I agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, especially because the the chapter where Harry retrieves it from the mirror is also not called The Sorcerer's Stone. I know, so yeah. It's not like an argument as to which chapter better embodies. Oh, I know. Because you could probably call that one The Sorcerer's Stone too. You absolutely could. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't mind The Man with Two Faces. I think, yeah. that's, I think that's good. But no, that's um, but I, I do think, yeah. So I would say I think chapter art is is kind of only okay for this one. Uh, but my rename would be Snape's Detour. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, or, or the Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. I like both those. There so, we go. There we go. So uh, anyway, but looking forward ahead to uh, next week's episode, which is going to be chapter fourteen, Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback. Which yes. I can I can only tell you that as I'm holding my book in front of me and seeing how little of this book is left, I can't believe how late this chapter happens in the story. Dude, this is like yeah. When I was reading this to Luke, I could not believe it's like you get to a certain point and it's like, okay, now this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It's like there's like big chunky things like each chapter is like its own little story. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So looking forward to chapter 14. Before we close out, do you have a review for us? I sure do, Ben. We have a review here from uh, DCGXD. Uh, uh, that's at least how it copied over. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Hello. hello. Uh, they said the coziness is the best. I feel like I'm sitting down in a fireplace with my father reading Harry Potter. The Carlin brothers are not only experts on HP, but they go out of their way to explain more details that you've missed previously when you read the books. Just give it one minute and you'll be hooked. Oh, so, thank you so much. That's so cool. I yeah. love it. Yeah, no, that's that's so that's such a sweet review. Well, it's very we, much the vibe we're going for. That is absolutely <laughs> we, at one point in time. We literally debated on how to possibly yeah, incorporate a fireplace into our, our visual set. If you're yeah. watching on YouTube or listening, which, uh, by the elsewhere. way, thank you for watching on YouTube. I have been so impressed with those numbers. So if you I mean, if you are, you know, if you want to throw us a subscriber thing, that would be uh, that would be amazing. Or just hit that hit that bell. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, of course. Be sure. Be sure to be the first in the know whenever a new episode drops. I would love it. Love it, you guys. If we could put a silver play button on the set behind us. Oh, my us, gosh. Okay? Look, because we have an empty frame right over there behind Ben. It's I don't know if you can tell exactly what that is from your vantage point, but we could put the button in there. We That'd could put be, the button there. That's where we could put it. The campaign for 100K. There we go. Yeah. So just, you know, if you want to help us out, even maybe if you're just listening on audio and you're like, let me go, let me just go into YouTube real quick and I'll just do that and we'll see if we can get the button. That would be super fun. Yes. We're still is. a ways off, but you know, I think we can get there. Yeah, it is its own YouTube channel. So yeah. through the Gryffindor, if you want to go check it out, we would super appreciate it. But yeah. otherwise, until next time. We, bye. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa. Excuse me. Sorry, 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 Jeez, sorry. man. My I bad. believe we end the episodes differently around here. That's my bad. My, it's been a minute. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> otherwise, join us next time through the Gryffindor. <laughs> totally nailed it. Totally <laughs> nailed it. Well done. <laughs>